Hello, I'm Rebecca Matter. I'm recording this presentation from Seattle, Washington. I'm going to provide an overview of the assistive technology situation in Southern Africa, the challenges and innovation. Thanks so much to SAFOD for the invitation to present today. So my presentation outline, I'm going to start with a story of an AT user I met in Zimbabwe many years ago. Then talk about the sources of information that I gathered for this presentation. Talk about the challenges in the AT sector in Southern Africa, but I'm going to focus most of my attention on the innovations to increase AT access, including some uh, small scale innovations that I learned about through my um, doctoral research. I'm going to start with a background story about somebody I met in Zimbabwe who uses a motorized wheelchair. And when I met him, he was trying to get home from work and was going in circles. Um, and he explained to me that the reason he was going in circles is because he needed a spare part for the steering mechanism. And it was going to come from South Africa and he had no idea when it was going to arrive. It had already been probably over a month. Um, and in the meantime, that was the only way for him to get around. Um, so obviously it's going to take him, you know, 10 times or 100 times the effort to get from A to B. And this for me has really become a metaphor for a lot of what's not working currently in the AT sector in Southern Africa. Um, and hopefully some of the ideas I'll present today will be about how can we stop going in circles? How can we have a more efficient system so people get their needs met? Most of the information that I'm gonna to present today came from my doctoral research that I did between 2016 and 2020 that included three studies, a systematic review, secondary analysis of quantitative data sets, and a regional qualitative study, which is where most of the information I'm presenting came from. Also, I gained a lot of insights from my involvement in the AT InfoMap project between 2016 and 2019 that uh, Safad led and is, is still um, running projects like, like this event right now um, out of that work. Uh, and also some recent policy developments in Africa that I've learned about through my involvement in the WHO Global Report on Assistive Technology. My qualitative study objectives were really to increase understanding about the barriers and facilitators to AC, AT access that shape the AT sector in Southern Africa and identify pervasive constraints across the sector. And really the purpose of doing all of that was to try and identify the solutions um, to address those constraints. So the qualitative study, I conducted a series of stakeholder interviews with actors across Southern Africa that represented public sector, private industry, nonprofit organizations, and a range of AT types. I also reviewed the regional and global documents, um, AT policies, standards, um, strategies, and research uh, that was specific to Southern Africa. So challenges in the AT sector. Um, I organized challenges into product supply, the AT system, and then looked at how those two components impacted end users. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about first is the product supply, um, and then I'm going to talk about very briefly the AT system, which has five components I've identified, which is awareness, financing, human resources, policies, and operations. So challenges in product supply, we all know that there's inadequate AT supply across Southern Africa, and that there's some AT products provided that are inappropriate for the user, for the context. Why? There's a lot of reasons why. Um, limited imports, limited local manufacturing, inadequate financing, lack of investment in the strengthening of the whole sector or developing new businesses, uh, supply chain inefficiencies, poor regulation, etc. And just to give an example of a supply chain inefficiency, this is from uh, one wheelchair provider in Johannesburg, said, um, Gaborone is closer to us, being in Joburg, 
than Cape Town, but it probably costs us five times as much to send a container of wheelchairs from Joburg to Gaborone as opposed to Joburg to Cape Town. So this just highlights uh, a regional supply chain inefficiency that it makes it very costly to get products um, from one country to another. So what's available currently? Now again, this is you know very broad generalizations, but uh, what I have gathered is that most of the AT provided in Southern Africa comes through South Africa. It's either manufactured in South Africa or imported by suppliers in South Africa before being exported to other countries. There's very little manufacturing outside of South Africa. There's some small scale workshops. Um, there's lack of investment and expertise to scale that up to a larger uh, capacity. There's been more access to mobility devices such as wheelchairs and crutches than other categories of AT um, and the products very greatly in quality and how well they match the context. Just very briefly, the challenges in the AT system you could spend an hour presenting on, but I'm just going to summarize some high level challenges, which is a weak policy environment, inadequate and fragmented funding and investment, shortage of skilled AT personnel, inefficient procurement and provision systems, and lack of information systems. And if there was a root cause that you could identify of all these weaknesses, um, perhaps you could tie it to lack of awareness and low prioritization of AT, and those are really reinforcing each other. Um, and there's also just a high level of fragmentation across the sector that makes it a very ineffective or inefficient sector. In talking about some of the challenges in the AT sector, I want to give some concrete examples with quotes um, with some of the stakeholders I interviewed. So the first one is about inadequate policies, regulations. When AT is not included in the minimum benefits of medical aid uh, regulatory bodies, so they regulate what medical aid companies must provide in their coverage. When AT is not included, it's not funded. So a quote from one of the the um, provider says, we're faced with the challenge of getting medical aids to cover a brace for a child. They won't allocate the same amount of funding for conservative management, which involves AT, as they would for surgery. There is just a huge imbalance, and that, what is, and that is really a challenge we are faced with. They will pay 200 to 300,000 Rand for surgery, but they won't pay a tenth of that for a brace. Uh, another example about AT not being prioritized within the budgetary process um, is uh, a quote from a, a direct service provider in the public sector who says, there's a lot of negotiation that goes on to get money into the budget, the AT budget. And it often depends on people at the local level fighting for that budget. If there's nobody there to fight for it, it's not going to be there. And one more example, it's a long quote, but I think it's worth <laughs> including because it really highlights some of the operational challenges that really are major bottlenecks to getting AT to even the funded AT, even the correct AT to the people who need it. So about a procurement inefficiency, um, this therapist quotes, Basically, it was a big paper chase. Each quote, so they have to get a quote for the cost of the AT product they're trying to order. Each quote was only valid for three months, so if you were delayed on getting any of the quotes or the procurement meeting was delayed as well, by the time you got there, the quotes had expired and you couldn't present it, so you had to start again. So you get the new quotes and you get it all together and you take it to your procurement officer and they might sit on it, they might lose it, might find problems with it and send it back to you. So it's the paperwork process. Even once it had been agreed at the hospital procurement meeting, there is no end to the things that can theoretically go wrong. So all these challenges, what do they add up to? 
for end users, they add up to lack of access. They add up to delayed access, sometimes waiting years to get the product that you need. Um, receiving inappropriate AT and lack of sustained use. So you don't have a product that you can use um, for as long as you need it. Thinking forward to solutions, um, one potentially useful way to do that is to look at the per pervasive constraints that are found across the sector and how these might be opportunities for shifting some of, of the patterns. So two high level patterns I identified in my uh, doctoral research was low prioritization and high fragmentation. And low prioritization is evident in the lack of funding and uh, lack of investment in overall system strengthening. And the high fragmentation is found with all the fragmentation and funding streams, lack of policy alignment, just the wide variety of AT products um, that are included and all the, the different actors that are involved in the sector. And those two patterns really result in a wasteful and underfunded sector and goes back to that original story of um, going in circles. <laughs> so the resources uh, and energy is not used effectively to uh, meet people's needs. So thinking about the future, um, what could it look like? And uh, this is a simple operational framework of inputs, outputs that lead to end users getting their needs met. So they get access, they get timely access, sustained use, and they receive appropriate AT. So when we started sector inputs, uh, this is organized around um, kind of the root causes to all the other aspects of system strengthening that need to take place. And increased awareness is at the bottom, meaning that it's really a route to all the other elements. So the increased awareness would lead to more robust and aligned policies, both at the national and the transnational level. That would lead to more financing. Now a stronger system means the outputs would be adequate and timely supply of appropriate products and parts and adequate services. So now I'm going to get into the strategic levers. So those are really innovations to increase access and I'll include some examples of businesses or different innovations to strengthen the AT sector. And levers are, the intention of the levers is that they make shifts in the sector as a whole, so not within one component, not just financing or within a specific type of AT. So the first lever, raising basic AT awareness. So this is what we really uh, discovered through the AT Info Map project was the there wasn't a lot of awareness about the range of AT that's possible and who could benefit from all the different types of AT that are out there in the world. There's a pretty limited understanding of the, the types of AT that were available. Um, so that broad-based awareness is really essential to all the other changes that are needed. And there's also a need for increased awareness about the extent of the AT needs, uh, the rights that people have to assistive technology through various uh, global and national policies and uh, laws, um, how to obtain the AT, uh, just where to start, how to navigate the system, what is appropriate AT, and about new and, and existing products um, that are available on the market. Another lever is standardizing and harmonizing the AT sector, which makes it easier for everyone to operate, especially businesses. So uh, one way to achieve that is to work through the existing harmonizing mechanisms for the region, such as SADC, the Southern African Development Community. Um, that's their role to harmonize policies. So it could be that 
there as an example that they could come up with a uniform trade policy where AT products are exempt from tariffs when traded between the SADC countries. Um, another way to harmonize and standardize is to rely on regulatory authorities outside of Southern Africa for registering suppliers, um, products, uh, and that can be a very costly process to develop that regulatory infrastructure if it isn't already in place. And this is already being done in the medical device industry. Um, so for South Africa, they any medical device that receives the review and certification or re regulatory device supplier, because both the company and the products you know, need to be certified that those products that have already gone through that process in a number of countries, such as Australia, Brazil, Canada, Japan, um, that those automatically become registered uh, within the Southern African um, medical device uh, industry. So it means that they can be provided within Southern Africa. So it's it's a way to, you know, simplify, make the whole system so much more efficient um, and expedite getting these new products into the market. Another lever is how countries are going to strengthen their AT systems. What strategies are they going to use to do that? And one way is to build upon the existing capacity that's within the national or regional AT sector, um, the expertise, the suppliers, the manufacturers, to make sure that those organizations are at the table in developing those strategies. Um, also coming up with a policy implementation structure that is suitable um, for that country. And ideally it's multi-sectoral because assistive technology covers health and education and labor, um, a, a number of different ministries that could be involved in that. Um, there's a number of policy tools that are available. The WHO GATE initiative um, created the assistive technology priority list that countries are now adapting. And this can be a really powerful tool in expanding the range of products um, and building it into the current procurement systems. So um, just in the last few months, the Ethiopian Ministry of Health has created their own national priority assistive technology product list. Um, and I, I'll, I'll provide that to George so he can give that to the participants. A very important lever is elevating the role of direct and full service suppliers. So these are suppliers, manufacturers of AT that have a long-term investment in the industry. So they have most likely the latest knowledge on developments in the industry, what new products are coming online, what are the needs. Um, they have expertise, they can provide training and services. They have direct relationships with the manufacturers. So it's easier for them to get the stock that they need or to get replacement parts. Um, and the opposite of that are what is called redundant intermediaries, which is people that are just buying and selling AT and have no expertise. Um, they might also be selling furniture um, and office supplies and AT. And unfortunately, those redundant intermediaries sometimes win the government tenders um, for various reasons. And so they're, they're not increasing the value. They don't have the capacity to really fulfill the full um, service needs that go along with products. Um, and also these, these direct and full service suppliers um, you know, such as like Shone Equip in South Africa that everybody knows. Um, there's a sensor, sensory logic um, that provides a low vision aids in Cape Town, micro edit. There's a, there's a number in South Africa um, that um, they also have expertise in, in what's happening in the market. Um, and, you know, part of their success as a company is 
increasing demand, which is increasing awareness. So sometimes they're doing the work of getting out and going school to school and clinic to clinic um, to talk about uh, assistive technology and how important it is. Um, so it's important to involve these direct and full service suppliers in developing the national strategies um, in order to make sure that you know they're they're relevant to what's going on in the ground. Lever five, uh, realizing the full product lifespan. So making products uh, last as long as possible. So repair programs, uh, reuse programs, making sure that when products are purchased, that they include repair services, replacement services, uh, spare parts. So that would be part of the procurement standards. Um, I want to give one example of a very innovative reuse program that is, I'm assuming, still operating in KwaZulu Natal. So there's a refurbishment in uh, reuse program for mobility devices that was established by one rehabilitation professional that works for the public sector. And this program was really developed out of necessity due to the severely limited and inconsistent supply of devices um, provided in that area. So the program was partially supported by some philanthropic funding um, and also some uh, public funding through the ministry and includes community outreach, trained repair personnel, a client product tracking database. Um, and one really interesting component is it relies on a strong network of community health workers that help identify the AT needs in the community or who no longer needs their assistive device. So there is about 150 community health workers that meet at a central hospital monthly, and there's a time in that meeting to see what's happening with the clients who have assistive technology. So for example, if a wheelchair user who had a stroke um, and then passed away, um, the community health worker would inform the reuse program so that that device can be picked up and refurbished and provided to someone else. Um, so this um, therapist said, we recycle at our hospital whatever device comes back and that can be reused, we reuse it. We make a patient sign a contract when we issue the chair that if you should no longer need the chair, you should bring it back because we have a very limited budget. And people are quite good about it. They don't bring it back when they live far away and it would cost them too money, much money to get there. Um, that is when the community health worker tells us and so we put it on our collection list. It's a great system. 60% of all the wheelchairs we issue are secondhand refurbished wheelchairs. So we're saving 60% of the budget. I have two wheelchair repairmen who are stipend by the Department of Health, which are amazing. And I think this should be in place, a standard across the board nationally. Everybody needs this. <laughs> so I think that's a very, um, a, a good example of an innovation that is working quite well and that uh, could be scaled up nationally to increase the product lifespan. Shaping the role of the global development community. Um, one important thing that's already happening, um, and this is quite timely because it just happened in July of 2021, that the WHO um, Regional Committee for Africa uh, published a framework for improving access to assistive technology for the WHO region, that WHO Africa region, and I'll also provide that to George. Um, so this is, this is a really potentially powerful tool to get harmonization um, across all of Africa, not just Southern Africa. Um, and this is mostly targeted towards the public sector and towards um, ministries of health, but it, it is like all uh, international and regional tools uh, encouraged to be adapted at the national level to ensure local relevance. And in more of a, a different sector, uh, the private sector, another example of working to harmonize um, policies and financing 
is working through the motor vehicle accident funds, also called road accident funds that many countries have in Southern Africa, and they provide a significant amount of assistive technology, even though it's for a limited, pop, it's a population of people who've been injured in um, car accidents, um, it's still to have uh, more consistency and availability of products um, through those funding mechanisms uh, would be very useful. And then, um, although this may not be the best thing to present at this conference that's focused on business innovation, <laughs> but I would encourage the global development community to prioritize investing in the innovations that remedy these AT system inefficiencies over investing in new products, because no matter how great the new product is, it's going to encounter the same delays, the same problems of getting into the local markets and then getting to the people who need them. Um, and there's an example of that um, that I learned about a few years ago of a prosthetic knee that was probably a tenth of the cost of what's currently used in a lot of um, Southern African countries and it had gone through all the ISO certifications. Um, but at the time when I talked to the innovators, they were really, they were experiencing challenges of trying to get that into the South African market. Um, so it's just, it's, it's exciting to invest in new products, but that's going to happen anyways, <laughs> because there's so much, there's so many innovators um, at all levels. Um, so really working, I think, uh, working at this, the system inefficiencies is really going to help boost the whole sector. And the final lever, practical solution oriented research. Um, this is really focused on, you know, trying to put the research energy into solutions. I think researchers, academics, myself included, can really focus a lot on what's not working and describing the problem in a million different ways. Um, but what we really need to push the sector forward is to look at the solutions and how are they working and when can they be scaled up or replicated or modified. Um, so doing research that really focuses on identifying those solutions um, and how those can be applied across different funding mechanisms, um, public and private, in, uh, international NGOs to increase access. Also identifying and sharing solutions that AT users are inventing every day out of necessity um, to go about their lives. And then finally synthesizing research evidence um, to be as actionable as possible within the Southern African context. So the more concrete and operational the better. Um, it's helpful to have broad strategies, but it really needs to get down to the nuts and bolts um, to make this, to make these policies, to make these plans um, real for people who need the technology. So finally, hopefully we will be on a path to a more efficient way of getting to our destination, uh, not going in circles. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to present today and I welcome feedback and critique. Uh, thank you so much. My email is here and if you want to read the full thesis, um, which you probably don't because it's like 200 and something pages, but maybe just go to the recommendations. Um, this is the link. Um, thanks again.